Greetings and welcome to our worship for the first Sunday of Lent. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church. Today I want us to remember. Memory is so important, especially in these crazy times. In saying this, I have to admit there are times, there are things, some things which I can remember quite vividly while other memories are rather sketchy. Some of my ancient memories are crystal clear while, while other more recent memories can be fuzzy. I suppose it depends on how great an impact any given event has had on your life. I may not remember the breakfast I had two days ago, but I sure do remember eating fried catfish at a catfish restaurant in Hickory, North Carolina. The greater the impact, the deeper it sears into your memory. And this can be true of good things and bad. For today, it is critical that you and I remember those key events that define our relationship with God. And with this, I invite us to begin our worship in prayer. God of life, source of all truth and beauty, you made this world with your own two hands. You fashioned the sea, the land, the greater and lesser lights in the sky. You created every living thing. You made us in your image, the image of goodness. When our love failed, you kept your covenant with us. In the fullness of time, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. His light is your light. His love is your love. Through him, you have brought us back into the fold. We're the sheep of your pasture. Forgive us then, Lord, when we go astray. Remind us of your great promise for those who love you. Give us hearts to follow you in these days. Be with all who struggle. Bring comfort to those who mourn. May we take courage in knowing that you will never forsake us, that you will lead us to those green pastures and peaceful waters, and will restore our soul. Through Christ who heals and saves, we pray. Amen. Will Thompson wrote one of the cheerful hymns back in 1904 when he wrote, Jesus is all the world to me. Born in East Liverpool, Ohio, Thompson graduated from college and attended the New England Conservatory of Music, and then later in Germany. A fierce patriot for the Union side, it said that Thompson purchased a large stone to mark the spot where Confederate General John Hunt Morgan and his raiders were captured near Lisbon, Ohio. Well, less known for the stone, Thompson has forever made his mark in hymns with his two famous in hymnals with his two famous songs, Softly and Tenderly, and Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings and he gives them o'er and o'er. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I, this friend deny, when he's so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. He watches o'er me day and night. Following him, by day and night, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now, I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, 
eternal joy, he's my friend. Who is Jesus to you? He's my friend. He's all the world to me. What a great song. Today's reading comes from the book of Genesis in chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Here are these words from the scriptures. When God said, then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become the, a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the bow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all of life on the earth. So ends the reading. Well, it surely must have been a frightful sight. The waters above and below unleashed, covering all the land, the cities, the mountaintops, not to mention all the people, until there was nothing but the sea and endless rain. Well, you remember the story, don't you? Finally, the rains cease, the winds blow across the waters to dry it up, and after 150 days, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. God blesses Noah and his sons and promises never again to destroy the earth by flood. And as a reminder, partly to Noah, but mostly for God, God sets the rainbow in the heavens. A reminder never again to do such a thing. Now you and I might speculate, well, death by a flood, that's just one of many ways the earth can be destroyed. Death by flood might be just one long list of God's options. Lately, some have wondered if the cold weather might be just as bad. But we forget that when God set the bow, the rainbow, in the heavens for us, while we see a beautiful multicolored rainbow, for God, it is the instrument of war that God is hanging up forever. His bow, his bow and, ever, and arrows. That bow is God's heavenly instrument of war, you see, which God has forever hung up. God is not using it anymore against humanity and the earth. And seeing that bow hanging on, on its proverbial hook up there in the sky is a good thing. It, it means God isn't going to use it against us and never will, whether that is by flood or, for that matter, any other means of destruction. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease, says the scriptures. It is the covenant, the promise God made. God will never again be known as the destroyer of humanity, but the protector of humanity, no matter how wicked or corrupt. Now, sometimes you and I employ tricks to remember things every now and then when I was working in my church office here in the church, a church member would come by with some tasty morsel. Sometimes it needed to, to go into the refrigerator before I would leave to go home at the end of the day. So I would take my car keys and place the keys beside the item in the refrigerator. I know more than one church member who has thought the pastor 
surely has lost his mind to place his car keys in the church refrigerator. But hey, you remember your way, I'll remember mine. I remember where I put my keys, and then I pick up the food along with my keys, and I make my way home with that item. Well, God placed the bow in the sky as a reminder to God not to destroy the earth again. That's the scripture. God said, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Now, God has perfect memory. The only thing God forgets are the sins for which we have been forgiven by God. God and only God can forget those things if God so chooses. But when it comes to everything else, God has perfect memory. Even still, God sets the bow in the sky as a reminder to God. Now, what seems like ancient history or prehistory to us, for God, it is an ongoing living covenant, a promise that holds true to this day. That's amazing when you think about it. God is holding true to God's word to this very day that happened back after the flood. Amazing when you think about it. God is holding true. It's good to know that in the middle of a pandemic, and even now that there is a vaccine, only to have to call and call and call and try to make an appointment to get your vaccine, and you either can't get through or there isn't enough vaccine available right now, or you try and try to make an appointment online because that's how some places tell you it must be done, and either the pharmacy online portal isn't working or your computer isn't working, and you just want to pick the thing up and throw it out the window, you know, it's good to know that God is still sticking to God's own promise. Through the centuries, despite war, disease, inhumanity, bad politics, despite everything people can possibly do against God and their neighbors, God is keeping that promise. God set the bow high in the sky as a reminder to God of the covenant, the promise of life for you and me. Second, God sent his son as a reminder to us of that covenant. Actually, God first sent Moses, Elijah, the law, and all the prophets to remind God's people that while God had not forgotten the covenant, neither should God's people. Christ reminds us to love as God loved. That's our part of the covenant. You and I live in a day when fear and hate is trying to get the upper hand. And it begins with our convictions. I fear these days we can become so set in our opinions that we are unwilling to consider any other view that is different than ours. We elevate our views as the only truth there is, while all other views must therefore be lies being professed by wicked people. You and I must be humble with our opinions, regardless of how deeply we hold them. There's a story told several years ago of a man in Arkansas who owned several acres of land that backed up to a neighbor's property. The neighbor noticed one day that this man had torn down a fence that had separated their property, the man being convinced that the fence was robbing him of a foot of land on his side. The man who tore down the fence then got a chair, placed the chair on what he thought was the correct property line, and sat down with a shotgun draped across his lap. Now, at first, the neighbor thought it was silly for this man to sit there all day long with a shotgun across his lap. Finally, the neighbor went outside and approached the man to discuss the matter, whereby the man shot and killed his neighbor, all over 12 inches of disputed property. And it was tragic, but it illustrates a common attitude we see today. We become so entrenched in our understanding of the truth, we refuse to listen to reason. We ignore the facts that are presented to us. We treat our neighbors as if they are enemies. We fail to love our neighbors as ourselves. We break the covenant again and again and again. And what is true as individuals is also true as a nation. Our government was formed on the premise that while we are a secular nation, 
Our national health relies on godly principles promoted by God's people who practice the golden rule. And when we do this well, our nation is strong. When we do it poorly, we see the results. If it were only the ones who are bad and know they're bad and own their badness, that would be one thing. But today, we are contending with ordinary folks who think they are doing good, but who in their twisted way of reasoning wind up planning and committing terrible crimes against our own nation. I'm thinking of the many ways common decency has been forsaken by people who make enemies out of their neighbors. I'm thinking, if we don't get our act together and relearn how to live peaceably, our politics will only reflect it, and we may see something worse than what happened January the 6th. God sent his son as a reminder to the nations that personal sin and national sin is a reproach to God, and that you and I need to remember that one nation under God means one nation under God regardless of party affiliation. We come together under God's banner and with love in our hearts for our neighbor, or we will surely come apart. Furthermore, God sends the church into the world to bring the world to God's holy covenant. He sends us. As the church of Jesus Christ, gifted by the Holy Spirit and as a sign to the world of the covenant God made to Noah, and all of, of Noah's offspring for generations until today, you and I represent not only ourselves, but the Christ who is in us and with us as a sign to the world of God's covenant love. When people look at us, they look at who we represent. When people hear our words, they are listening to see if, if we are being true to the gospel or behaving like hypocrites. We know this because... Well, they remind us. They may not be living according to the ways of Christ, but they expect us to as members of God's church. And when we don't, not only do we stumble, they stumble too. The good news is that the church is not made up of one person. It's made up of a whole bunch of people. This truth now has been tested lately as you and I have been forced to be distanced from each other, but it's just as true now as it has ever been. One of the means of grace God gives us is the church, Christian fellowship, whether that is expressed in the pews or online. Together, we remind each other who and whose we are. We compare notes. We get the story straight as we share the story. We bear one another's burdens and we help one another be that bright and shiny witness to the world of God's covenant of love and mercy. I've been very fortunate in my ministry to have relatively few run-ins with people. There have been times when we disagreed and we would discuss our disagreements with one another, but rarely have I been on the outs with another person where we are actually at odds. But occasionally I have. It's no fun either. I believe I have shared this with some of you. Early in my ministry, I was in a discussion with a, a person who attended one of our Sunday school classes. She was not a member of the church, but she, she liked her Sunday school class. First year I was there as the pastor, she wanted the annual Sunday school party to be held at her home for that class. I shared this in the church newsletter together with the information on all the other Christmas Sunday school party, Sunday school class parties. The next day I received a phone call from her and she lit into me like a wet hornet. The audacity that I would inform others of her hosting the annual Sunday school party for her class. That was her business and no one else's, she said. I tried to explain that as a part of the church, the Sunday school class parties are one of the annual church functions that we normally share with the congregation, but I did not get that opportunity. After 10 minutes of tongue lashing, she hung the phone up on me. Now, I must admit, there was a part of me that wanted to call her back and let her have it. The next day, the president of the Sunday school class raised this concern 
of hers over the situation saying, you've got to do something about this, Pastor. The whole Sunday school class is upset and we don't know if we're going to have our party. I thought about it long and hard and decided that because I'm the pastor, I need to make it right somehow. So I met the woman at the church and ate some humble pie and apologized. Wasn't sure what I was sorry about, but you know, sometimes you have to say I'm sorry. I later shared this situation with a friend and told him that I felt obligated as the pastor to do this and to try to make peace. My friend politely corrected me. He said, you may think you did that because you're the pastor. But pastor, the way I read the Bible, you did it because you're a Christian. And whenever possible, Christians always live peaceably with each other. Hmm. He reminded me of the covenant we profess as Christians, as members of God's church. Even when we think we are dead in our rights, the overriding principle always is to live in peace with our neighbors whenever possible. That's our responsibility as Christians and certainly as a church. It's part of the covenant we keep and witness to. It's not always easy. And you may have to eat humble pie from time to time, but it's much better than the alternative. And it makes for a better witness to the world. God calls us to love our neighbor. It's the covenant the church bears witness to, even and especially to those neighbors who may be difficult. In the words of the Apostle Peter, it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. That covenant that Christ holds up and lives out through his life, it's the covenant from God, a covenant that God keeps. He sent his son as a reminder to keep our part and to love our neighbor and to make that possible. He gives us the church as the means of grace to do just that, together through the Holy Spirit. I call on us, you and I, this day, to remember the covenant God has given us, the covenant God remembers and keeps. May you and I do likewise. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for the promise you have always remembered to give life, to watch over us, to protect us. Help us as we strive to remember the covenant too. Help us to live in peace and in love with our neighbor. Give us hope in the days to come as we wait for new life to burst forth again and as we rejoice in our salvation through you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, it's so good being with you today. Receive now today's blessing and sending forth for this, the first Sunday of Advent. Now and always, may the God of the covenant be the God of your every blessing. May favor and peace be multiplied to you so much that you have to give some away. May you forever be reminded each time you encounter a rainbow, each time you think of Christ, each time you worship him together with others, that it is the power from God alone that sustains you and makes you whole in these days. Go in peace. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless and keep you. Bye now.